The success of the radio ballads established McCull as the leading figure in the rapidly expanding folk movement. Every town in Britain had its folk club, and McCull and Seeger toured constantly. The Ballads and Blues Club in London had reorganized under the name of the Singers Club, with McCull and Seeger as resident performers. It attracted young singers like John Faulkner, who worked with McCull for nearly 10 years. I was born go down Out of the hard black coal face I was torn go down Kicked on the world and the earth split open Crawled through a crack where the rock was broken Burrowed a hole away in the coal go down In a cradle of coal in the darkness I was laid go down Down in the dirt and darkness I was raised go down Cut me teeth on a five foot timber, held up the roof with me little finger, started me time away in the mine, go down. On the day that I was born, I was six foot tall, go down. The very next day I learned the way to haul, go down. On the third day worked at board and pillar, I worked on the fourth as a long wall filler, getting my steam up, you in the seam go down. I felt myself that the that folk song was a political issue. And it's not just about sitting around singing songs about fox hunting in pubs. It's much more than that. And as so social docu documents, the folk songs are uh, not just there on pieces of paper to be looked at in museums, but should actually be performed and brought to people's attention. McColl used the Singers Club as a platform for his ideas. It was uh, very much controlled by Ewan, who did most of the int introductions and introduced people, and it was a very educational kind of uh, sort of set up, you know. It was more like a, an illustrated lecture, really, rather than a gig, you know. That was, and everybody was, we were, all, the, all the kids, when I say kids, most, of, most people were fairly young that went there, were very much in awe of this man sitting with the back to front chair, um, pouring out these words of wisdom and then singing songs to illustrate it. It was very exciting. I mean, it was very good. In the United States, there was a folk boom developing on parallel lines. Performers like Rambling Jack Elliott and Simon and Garfunkel spent time in London. So too did the rising star of the Greenwich Village set, Bob Dylan. The Singers Club was likely to be their first port of call. He was just breaking it at the time. But the word did go out and there were a lot of people there and it was packed and very steamy, smoky atmosphere and everything clicked and went down a storm. Everybody was very impressed and they knew that they were listening to something new. This wasn't somebody singing Woody Guthrie songs. It was somebody who was making their own statement. A bit later on, when people like Dylan and Joan Baez emerged as stars, the attitude of the British sort of like folkies changed dramatically. They were no longer uh, acceptable and they became people that you'd be basically just, you didn't buy their records. When Peter, Paul and Mary and Joan Baez took Dylan's songs to the top of the charts, McCull was unconvinced. He felt they were exploiting a tradition they didn't understand. In a Melody Maker interview at the time, he declared, this boom has been artificially created and it won't be over until big money has been made by the people who created it. We're going to get lots of copies of Dylan, people with one foot in folk and one foot in pop. The last straw for those who adopted the McCull position came when Dylan went electric in 1965.
In the unlikely setting of their flat in Beckenham in Kent, McColl and Seeger gathered round them a small group of young singers who were equally concerned about the direction folk music was taking. They called themselves the Critics Group. On a typical evening when it was at its height, you'd have about 10 to 20 people there. And he'd be sending every people off in pairs to different corners of the house with a subject for a song, um, an approach to the song, and he'd say, come back with a song about this. People would come back with their songs, very quickly written, and they'd dis each one would be sung and they'd be discussed why they worked, why they didn't work, how it could be done better, from all angles, from the metre that it was written in, the tune, the poetry, and whether the the song put across what it was intended to. And what, what age were you when all this was going on? I'm not really sure. I must have been... I would have been from eight or nine onwards until the age of about 13 or 14, I suppose. The critics group thing was exciting because, you know, of an evening, they'd all be doing these very odd things, which is you'd walk into a room and there'd be a group of people writing a song and their brief was to write a song in 20 minutes about this subject or walk into another room and there'd be people doing voice exercises. Um, I sort of, for a bit, thought all families must be like that. But it was very odd. And we were noticing that a lot of songs were being changed because people didn't know how to perform them. So in a way, it was a how to perform group that used a lot of acting techniques, a lot of intellectual mm, talk, and a lot of observation of what folk musicians did do. So. If we were worrying about how to accompany a song, say, we would look at what folk accompaniments, uh, accompanists did on similar types of songs in contiguous cultures. We'd say, they do this, they don't do this, they do this, they don't do this, therefore, let's pick up the concertina and let's try applying this, not applying that idea, which, let's throw that one out, using this and this. And we worked out a number of, of ways of applying principles without necessarily applying specific harmonies taking specific melodies, but just taking the ideas. You have to really be committed to an idea if you're going to move people, if you're going to create for people unfor an unforgettable experience. Uh, the experience almost of, a, of an evolutionary jump so that you sort of remember the time you first started thinking. I think it's, without that, I can't really see why actors stay in the theater, why painters paint. Why sculptures sculpt a sculpt? I can't really think what, what, what the reason is if there is not, not that kind of dedication, not that kind of identification with the medium. We, we all knew that he was a very, very difficult person too. Not difficult in the sense of being temperamental. He wasn't temperamental. He was just very strict. He was like a bit kind of schoolmasterish in the sense of um, he wanted things done his way and he had a, a kind of a military fashion about doing things. And being in the critics group was a bit like that in the sense of this is, we're in a, going in a direction. You know, we have a, we have a kind of a mission to fulfill. And people, of course, were young enough to think in those terms, people that really. Gear, as he done before, and bids adieu to his native shore. For 